world model for me is a, a model that can understand the state of the world and predict how it's going to change given an action that you put into it. So mathematically speaking, it's a, a function that takes your current state, your current action and predicts the next state. Essentially a, a simulator. It's a model that can allow you to understand how the world will evolve given different things you might want to do or interact with that world. The result of this is a world model that can simulate the future. And if you want to, you can take that state and decode it back to video. So you can produce the, the, right. the video output of, of what's actually going to happen. But you might not want to, if you want to keep this real time and efficient, you can just stay in your embedding space and use it to drive your car. And Hi, I wanted to jump in and give a shout out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So, you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. They support us, so let's support them. I'm Craig Smith, and this is I on AI. This week, I speak with Alex Kendall, CEO of Wave AI, to understand Wave's innovative approach to autonomous vehicles using a world model called Gaia-1. Alex explains the advantages of world models, which we've explored before on this podcast with Jan LeCun, and how they can be used in AI agents. The discussion offers a unique view on the progress, promise, and obstacles in developing AI to act in the physical world. I hope you find the conversation as fascinating as I did. I'm an engineer at heart. I've loved building things ever since I was uh, growing up and, and did so with uh, in, in, the, in the back garden, but got the chance to work on a bunch of robotics in my childhood in New Zealand, uh, whether it's building drones to chase some sheep around the field that I grew up in or, um, you know, other, other projects I did at university. Uh, but one way or another, they ended up taking me to the University of Cambridge. Uh, I spent um, you know, many years there doing a PhD and research fellowship in computer vision. Uh, fortunate enough to publish some of the first work that uh, applied deep learning to scene understanding algorithms like semantic segmentation, um, depth motion, uh, uh, other forms of scene understanding. And um, uh, and yeah, and I think that work really inspired uh, some of the ideas uh, that, I, that I've had to be able to build machines that can make decisions for themselves. Interestingly enough, a lot of my, uh, a lot of my PhD work stopped short of understanding the future or doing future prediction, which is, I think, uh, you know, one of the big topics we've been able to address with world models yeah. and, and Gaia, which I'm looking forward to talking about. Yeah. Uh, well, that's uh, fascinating. And and as I said, I just had Jan LeCun on the podcast talking about world models. He mentioned Gaia. Uh, 
and I, so where do I start? Uh, I'm interested in in world models as an alternative to large language models. Um, and uh, Gaia One, your model, uh, Yen says it's, it's a little different uh, than his JEPA architecture that he's using uh, to research world models. So can you can you tell us a little bit about Gaia One? And then I have a lot of questions. I'm interested in uh, in in marrying this tech with robotics. Uh, because the big challenge in robotics beyond the hardware is building uh, uh, an AI brain that can uh, plan and make decisions and that sort of thing. And and there's a lot of talk right now about uh, LLMs being able to play that role, but I also think there are a lot of problems uh, because uh, of the... Uh, hallucinations or the, you know, uh, the fact that large language models uh, don't have a very concrete underlying uh, model of the world. So w why don't you talk about Gaia, how that came about, what it is, uh, both uh, uh, generally and then uh, how it's built, and, and we'll go from there. Well, taking a step back, uh, maybe some background. Uh, I um, so I lead Wave, uh, an autonomous driving company, and how we've uh, you know we've set off on a different path to build autonomous driving systems that have the onboard intelligence to drive different vehicles in new places, including places they haven't been to before, and understand the complexity and the long tail of situations that you see on our roads. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a you know taking an AI approach to autonomous driving is is you know, quite contrarian and different to how uh, people usually look at this problem. When we started six years ago in, in 2017, um, we set off to build an end-to-end -end neural net that could learn to, to drive, you know, take the data as input and output a motion plan to control a vehicle. Uh, and this end-to-end -end AI approach, uh, I guess, you know, why are world models interesting here? So a world model for me is a, a model that can understand the state of the world and predict how it's going to change given an action that you, you, know, you put into it. So mathematically speaking, it's a, a function that takes your current state, your current action and predicts the next state. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a, um, essentially a, a simulator. It's a, it's a model that can allow you to understand how the world will evolve given different things you might want to do or interact with that world. Why is this important for self-driving? Well, the first thing you might look at when you're building an end-to-end -end neural network to drive a car is to build something that's autoregressive, build something that creates a function that takes your input state and produces the motion plan that you should drive with. And that's kind of what people did in large language models. And the problem with self-driving is it's a safety critical application. If you make the wrong decision, you're not just going to put out some hallucinated text, but you know, it's, it's life and death decisions of driving on our roads. So for that reason, it's really important that you are aware of the implication of your decision and you can understand the dynamics of the world. So that's really what motivated us to start off with uh, world models as a concept. And in 2018, we actually published a blog uh, with one of the first examples of, of doing this. We, uh, on, on an autonomous vehicle, we published a model-based reinforcement learning system where uh, actually only on a quiet country road, but we learned to drive a car with a, a world model. So this uh, system had never driven an actual car. It only learned in its imagination in a world model, but it used this, this model that it trained of the dynamics of the world to be able to learn to operate this car and drive it down a quiet country road. And I guess over the last six years, I can talk more about Gaia, but uh, over the last six years, we have scaled that approach to the point it is today, where with the latest and greatest in generative AI, we can now understand the full, diverse, rich, dynamic urban scenes that, that we operate in today, like central London. Uh, and building the world model, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the autonomous driving systems to date are, help me out here, but they're primarily reinforcement learning uh, systems uh, that are taking in uh, uh, data from various sensors and have trained uh, on what what the best uh, approach 
is in any particular situation. Is that right? Or, or, or what is the current state of uh, autonomous driving systems? Well, we're having an AI conversation and fundamentally autonomous driving is an AI problem. It's a problem of complex, high dimensional decision making. And so you'd assume that you're going to use a data driven method like reinforcement learning to do it. But actually, that's not the case. If you look at all of the large autonomous driving efforts out there today outside of WAVE, you know, primarily the approach is a traditional robotics one. It's one of um, yes, you use deep learning for perception. But once you have the state of the world, it's very much a, you know, hand coded uh, optimization approach to produce a motion plan uh, that's aided by a set of infrastructure like HD map, high definition maps that tell the car where and how to behave. So it's actually not an AI approach. And what we've done is, is you know, I think the first um, time an AI system has actually driven on the roads at, at this level of scale. So that's not how, uh, how the industry has traditionally approached things. When you bring in an AI approach, of course, you know, the challenges there are how do you understand what it's doing? How do you um, uh, make sure it's safe and making the right decisions? Uh, and so that's brought up some of these challenges that led us down the road of, of, of world models. So, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that about autonomous driving systems. So they're, they have all these sensors that data is coming into a, a central decision maker. And you're saying that decision maker is a traditional control system and not probabilistic AI system? Broadly speaking, yes. I mean, a lot of the systems running around San Francisco today, for example, are, 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 of, are of that approach. Now, more and more machine learning is being used throughout um, over, over, over you know, year on year in these systems, but uh, it's not an end-to-end -end neural net. It's not a, um, right. a large transformer that, that, that decides the whole decision-making. And that's the step that we've taken to replace that entire stack with one big uh, neural network um, that that learns how to drive end to end, right? And and I've seen a lot written recently about using the reasoning power of large language models uh, to 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 play that role to decide on uh, actions, and then uh, you know with some other piece of software to translate that action to execute on that on that plan. Uh, and, and can you talk about, uh, well, first of all, for, for Gaia, uh, it, the world model, there, so there's a world model that's, uh, building a state of the world in, in, uh, in its, I guess it's weights, uh, and then, uh, a reinforcement learning model that, uh, that learns to act on those uh, on that uh, state of the world. Is that right? Maybe you can describe the architecture a little bit. Yeah, uh, let me let me jump into some of those details. We've got a research paper online uh, that, uh, that talks about them in great depth. But um, one of the interesting things for me is that, you know, if you look at the three big major trends that we've seen in large language models this year, I mean, at the start of the year, it was all about scale. Everyone was talking about how many parameters, how much data, how much compute are these models trained on. In the middle of the year, it became about multimodality. We pushed scale uh, to some some degree, and now it's about how do we understand across different modes. And you know, a lot of image image text systems came out, for example. And then more recently, it's about synthetic data. Uh, you know, um, the benefits of synthetic data are clear. You can control the bias in your training data. Mm -hmm. uh, you can ensure that the training data is, you know, equally sampled across the things you care about. Or you can control the distribution of your training data. Uh, and uh, you can often get information that, uh, you know, is harder to understand from noisy real data alone. And so I think um, those three trends that have really driven the state of the art and, and say, large language models. Um, the interesting thing is we've seen the exact same thing play out in robotics. Uh, so for us at Wave, um, you know, we've been pushing the scale of our neural network that drives the car. And in the next year, our roadmap is going to be pushing this in terms of parameters, data and compute by 100x further, two orders of magnitude further. And so um, the results, the emergent behavior we're seeing come out is just remarkable. The ability for the car to nudge its way through crowds of pedestrians, to um, do complicated, unprotected turns, to predict the behavior of other agents cutting in or moving around our vehicle, all of this kind of thing emerges at that level of scale. 
The second trend uh, on multimodality, uh, you know, that's where I think it's really important to be able to um, learn to understand between different modes, because ultimately, if you're training a self-driving car just off the video data it has, it's going to be intelligent, but, you know, perhaps it'd be more intelligent if it doesn't only have that video data, but also, you know, text and other information sources it has. When you and I learned to drive, um, I learned to drive when I was 16 uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I had what well, maybe my, my mum and dad probably had, had 20 or 30 hours in the car with me. Uh, maybe not that long. Maybe I, maybe I learned in something like five or 10 hours. I think, I hope I was a fast learner, but you know, that kind of length of time to learn how to drive. Um, but it wasn't just that, that allowed me to drive. It was probably the 15 or 16 years of experience I'd had of learning how the world works, learning what objects are, how things might behave on the roads. And it was that observation that gave me the intelligence to drive. I think that seeing the same is true in robotics. Um, we can train our autonomous driving system now, not just on the video data of it driving, but also internet video and scale of internet, uh, video and text you know we can literally feed it the the pdf document of the highway road code that the government writes and give it that as you know further context to understand and so i think multimodality is becoming really important to bring together different sources of information and improve the intelligence of your system um, but then secondly uh with with text specifically you know i think the future of how we interact with robots is going to be through language uh, we are going to be talking to our robots, uh, interacting with them. You know, there's a reason why you and I have evolved language as a way we communicate is because it's the most efficient way to get information across that, that you know, that we understand. Uh, um, and, uh, and so for that reason, or maybe not most efficient, but most natural way. And so for that reason, I think the accessibility of robotics will be greatly improved by us being able to just literally converse with it. You should be able to be in your self-driving car and say, take the next left, take the next right, drop me off here, or I'm worried about this, why are you doing that? And you should be able to you know, build a sense of trust through it. And we've done exactly that at Wave. We've produced a system called Lingo, which is a first a vision, language, action foundation model that combines those modalities of video, of action and robotics, and language that allows us to talk to our autonomous vehicle and ask it why, what it's doing. And then finally, uh, uh, the third trend on synthetic data, and this is where Gaia comes in. Uh, Gaia, our world model, um, not only is it a system that allows our, uh, our AI to understand the implications of the decisions it make, it's making, um, but also produce synthetic data. Uh, generative AI is very good at recombining data in new ways. And so, you know, we have lots of experiences of foggy scenes on the car. We have lots of experiences of jaywalking scenarios, but we have very few foggy jaywalking scenarios. And Gaia can not only allow us to understand how the world's going to evolve, but it can create new examples we haven't seen before. And again, we can do that by connecting vision, language, and action. We can prompt it and say, you know, literally give it a prompt and say, I want an example of a jaywalking pedestrian in the fog. Uh, or we can take a scene that exists in the real world and, and you know, change it and, and ask it to, to recreate it with new new features and things like that. Um, I didn't really get into the architecture guy, and I'm happy to, but uh, I just thought those those three trends have been really powerful for us in, in AI. And, uh, and, you know, uh, exactly applicable to robotics as well. Yeah. Uh, so you can tell from my questioning, I'm a journalist, uh, not a, a, a practitioner. Uh, so my knowledge is fairly surface, but I understand large language models uh, to a degree. I understand the transformer algorithm and, and the large language models are predicting the next token in a sequence. And because of the volume of training data, it does a very credible job most of the time. Uh, a world model, I understand uh, Jan's uh, JEPA arc architecture, the joint embedding predictive architecture uh, to a degree. Uh, he says your model is is something different. So can you kind of walk us through at a very high level of uh, how uh, the, the model is trained and and what it's doing? It's predicting the, the, the next state of the world, whether it's video or text or whatever. Is it doing that with uh, a, a transformer algorithm? Uh, how is it doing it? Just... just um, I'm sure the the audience would also like to hear. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, Yan and I share a lot of common belief around these systems. We think that 
um, to go beyond the autoregressive nature of large language models of just predicting the next word and getting to systems that can understand uh, and be safety critical, we need to have world models. Um, we share the vision that these should be unsupervised. These should be able to be trained through self-supervision, uh, through, you know, whether it's signals like contrastive learning or building energy spaces or things like this. Um, you know, I think we share a, a lot in common there. Uh, um, I mean, Je Jepper is, is, is a great architectural approach. Uh, I, you know, I think, um, uh, I think there's a, a lot in common in these systems in terms of there's some representation space. Um, you want to train it with, with unsupervised learning. And, and so for our approach in particular with, with Gaia, what we first do is we take, um, you know, we tokenize up the different inputs, whether it's images, action, or language. And uh, essentially it's a, well, today it's a large transformer, but you could use whatever your favorite flavor of neural network uh, 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 or the, uh, let's say machine learning um, uh, system that you want to use. Uh, but essentially you, you take those inputs and, and you learn this, uh, this dynamics model, this ability to take current state, current action and predict next state. Uh, and then the result of this is a world model that can simulate the future. And if you want to, you can take that state and decode it back to video. So you can produce the, the, right. the video output of, of what's actually going to happen. But you might not want to, if you want to keep this real time and efficient, you can just stay in your embedding space and use it to drive your car. And, um, you know, right now we're working on Gaia 2 and Gaia Drive. And these are systems that we're, um, um, you know, that, that, that very much are going to see Gaia embedded in the in the vehicle uh, able to actually increase the intelligence understanding and improve the safety criticality of our system uh, in, in a production setting so that's that, that's really the, the, the guts of the architecture it's a uh, today it's a transformer uh, that's able to predict future states and uh and again forgive me i'm sure you'll cringe at my uh repeating this back to you in in uh sort of super layman's language but uh, you're encoding the the data coming in, or tokenizing it, and and uh, in, in, and turning it into embeddings in uh, uh, I guess you call it a, a, a feature space or or embedding dimension, <clears throat> and you're making predictions based on that uh, at that level. So they're they're um, and then to see the video, you decode it into uh, pixels. But um, in that space, it, it you can predict the. Is it how specific is uh, are those representations? When I said embedding space, I guess I meant representation space. Yeah. One of the other big challenges of self-driving compared to large language models is the amount of data you have as input is enormous. I mean, take our you know latest vehicle, for example, it's six or seven cameras. Uh, they have eight megapixels each, uh, and then you care about multiple frames over time, and not to mention the uh, like if you consider an imaging radar as well, or you know choose the sensors you want to use. Just in cameras alone, the the data, you know, eight megapixels, uh, your RGB values there, so you know. Um, uh, 24 bytes, uh, uh, 24 million bytes alone from those. Multiply that by the six cameras. Uh, there you've got about 120 million bytes, uh, and then multiply that by multiple time frames. I mean, you're talking about gigabytes of data there alone, uh, and that uh, you know that data. Uh, what it does is it makes it. Uh, you can't have an embedding space where you're dealing with gigabytes of data. It's just, it's just too much to, to process. And so to make these models practical, you need to be able to take that extraordinary amount of input data, all those videos, and compress them into an embedding space that you can reason about. So I guess the question is, how many factors do you think you care about for a driving scene? You know, you can list them out. You care about the positions of the cars in front of you, the, the, the pedestrians, the cyclists, the direction they're facing, the way they're going to move, um, the weather conditions. Uh, the traffic light, all these kind of factors. Now, interestingly, if you go down the path of trying to list them out by hand, you end up in the AV 1.0 or the classical robotics approach to autonomy. And that doesn't scale because it's very hard to enumerate all those factors and, and to reason about them a priori. Mm -hmm. So um, we can do it as a thought exercise, but uh, uh, I wouldn't advocate for that approach. But the, the point is, is that it's not, 
you know, hundreds of millions of numbers, there's probably a much smaller set of things that you care about there. Uh, and so we want to learn that, you know, you don't care about the pixels in the sky, except you want to know the weather, but you don't really care about all those things. It's, there's a lot of redundant information in, in the signal. Compare that to large language models, you have sentences of text that are really high signal to noise ratio. You know, text is precise at saying this means that and impacts this, right? It's a direct description of what you care about compared to videos where most of the pixels in, in an image you don't care about. Clouds, you know, second story of a building, you don't care about when you're driving. Um, mm -hmm. So the point is you want to be able to take this data and embed it in a very efficient space and the way we do that is through end-to-end -end learning about you know what do we care about for driving what actually is going to impact how the world's going to evolve um, and that's what we that's what we look to learn so we look to build a transformer and a self-supervised learning approach that learns an embedding that is really efficient is as small and compressed as possible but has the information that we need to understand the safety critical natures of of the scenarios that we're driving through um, so that's the primary task of, of that embedding model and that, that learning model of, of, of the scene representation. Yeah. And then uh, uh, right now that, you know, I've seen some remarkable uh, videos that you've done and uh, maybe I'll, I can, um, you know, splice one into this uh, podcast, but they're, they're, they're awesome when you go drive in the car. I go out most weeks and when you see it, learn new behaviors week on week. Um, like just yesterday, I was went, I went for a drive uh, down in a part of London in Notting Hill and we went through Portobello Road Market. Uh, it's this mm -hmm. crazy area with loads of pedestrians uh, all on the road. And the fact, I've never seen our car sort of nudge its way through a crowd of pedestrians for, but it did so really safely um, in a way that, uh, you know, if you just stopped and waited for the pedestrians to clear, you'd be stuck there for an hour. Uh, so like these kind of new behaviors over time, there's tons of videos that we have online uh, of this stuff, but it's, uh, it's pretty amazing seeing AI operate in the physical world like, like this. Yeah. Uh, but the, the videos, uh, so you're, you're, you're then decoding the representation, the representation space into, uh, pixels in a video, uh, that's useful. Uh, I, presume f f for creating training data. Uh, but when you're actually driving in real time, uh, how is, is uh, that state of the world being translated into action? Uh, and that's where I think you said there's a, uh, an RL engine or agent uh, that's, that's learning over time how to act on that. Can you talk about that part? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the amazing things about Gaia properties are that they yeah, can create photorealistic and diverse scenes that are controllable by text. You can modify these environments uh, and you can also um, create multimodal futures. Uh, I think the really powerful thing is when you only observe the past, you know, you can't predict how the future is going to unfold in a driving scene. And the fact that Gaia can generate diverse multimodal plausible futures is a uh, yeah, a really important, um, uh, a really important factor. But uh, uh, yeah, to, in order to actually control the car, so this is what we call Gaia Drive. Um, it's a, uh, uh, it's you know, it's not just um, decoding to to images, but also well, there's many ways that, that you can go about thinking about incorporating Gaia into into a, a into a, a driving system. For example, you could um, generate. You know, future data and use that synthetic data to actually just train a system. You could uh, use it to predict the future and use the information it learns about predicting the future to improve the driving representation. Uh, or you could actually bring it into a full on, you know, uh, model based reinforcement learning or model predictive control or some kind of learn simulator. What that means is that let's say you're at a driving, uh, you're at a, a, a green light and you want to decide whether you drive through the intersection. What the system can do is it can um, you know, perceive, uh, run, run its world model, run Gaia for a few seconds ahead and see what might happen. Maybe it runs it a few times and sees how various different things happen. And then it can make a decision based on how it thinks the future is going to play out. Um, we do that in, in our brains and in, in our, in our hippocampus, we have mechanisms that are, you know, most famously referred to, uh, as sort of thinking fast and thinking slow, thinking fast, the reactive decision-making, you don't really plan ahead. You just, you just do, whereas thinking slow 
you take a step back and you sort of reason uh, what might happen, should I do this? And you sort of play chess a few, a few steps forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can do the same thing in robotics. Robotics has typically had, you know, two levels of control. There's like a low level control that runs at over a hundred times a second that controls parts of a robot. And you have a high level control that operates typically around 10 times a second that does the high level reasoning. But actually what these kind of models that you do is maybe move one more level up abstract and have a three tiered system. You can have a thinking slow thing, which can involve a large language model to interact and to reason and to plan. It could involve a world model to actually understand the implications of these decisions. And that might happen at anything from one hertz, you know, one time a second to maybe even one time every 10 seconds. It's quite an infrequent high level. If you think about when you're driving, that sort of high level kind of topological task planning you do can happen at the highest level. Then that middle tier, you know, you're, decide, you're designing the motion plan that you want to follow to ensure you don't hit things and that you follow road rules. That's more re reactive and it runs it at that kind of 10 times a second higher. And then the 100 times a second is sort of the minute changes in brakes and brakes and steering to make sure that you actually achieve that plan that you've set out. And that three tier uh, system, I think is, uh, uh, so I think world models can play a, a really great role in, in that top one, a new level of higher level reasoning into, into robotics. And uh, the advantages of that over uh, agents built purely off of large language models is that they're, they're, they require a less compute, I would imagine, but also, um, uh, their, 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 their decisions or their predictions are grounded, uh, more firmly in reality, where as a large language model, even if it's tokenizing, uh, pixels in a video, uh, it's, it's only predicting one token ahead as it goes along. Is that right? Yeah, look, I think large language models and world models can be complementary, right? Like large language models give you the ability to understand, well, they give you a text interface, they give you a ability to interact through language, but they give you the ability to learn a really incredible understanding of the world through internet scale text. And world models, the advantages of world models is they give you the ability to understand the implication of your decision, whether you are making a, a driving task decision or whether you are outputting um, sentences and text, you know, whatever it may be, it allows you to understand, okay, what is the implication of that decision in the environment I'm operating in? Is that a good thing or not? And that understanding can help you do things in a safety critical environment. So I think world models become really important in an application like self-driving, maybe not so much in like an internet search problem, uh, but when you have safety critical applications, whether that's in you know, medical correspondence of language models or self-driving for, for our application, that's when uh, world models give you the ability to do that. The other yeah. advantage I'd, I'd describe though is, is not just at runtime, but also at training time. World models give you the ability to learn more efficiently. Uh, we do this in our, in, our, in, our, in our brains as well. As people, we, uh, we daydream or, or night dream. When we dream, we actually uh, go through a process that solidifies our actions and lets us replay experiences to learn to do them better next time. Um, yeah, like if, if you're learning to, to play tennis and you, you hit a ball uh, once, you know, you're not going to hit a ball with every single permutation of the angle that your racket might be to learn how it might go. You might only hit it a few times, but from that, you need to learn the general way of how to hit a ball to get it in the right part of the court to be able to play tennis. And what we do is from the ways that we hit the ball, we actually, um, you know, replay this in our internal world model many times when we daydream um, to be able to learn how to do that more effectively. And the same is true with machine learning. When you have a world model, you can get more out of your training data. You can um, replay, recombine, reconfigure, and use that to understand your training data uh, and, and learn a lot more uh, performant, effective, or safe uh, uh, policy or, or decision-making system from your training data because of the fact that you can learn and recombine those experiences in new ways. So world models are really powerful, both training and at inference or testing time. Uh, so, and, and you uh, you have this, uh, system, not only, uh, creating training data, uh, but, uh, acting as an agent to drive a car. How, how many, how developed is that system? Uh, how far is it, uh, from commercialization, for example, 
uh, how many cars do you have it in and how many road miles have you logged and that sort of thing? Yeah, we've been, we've been spending the last uh, six years building a different approach to autonomy. And where we're at today is we've been able to demonstrate that it can do a lot of things that have been blocking the industry for many years. It can drive on the kind of equipment that's on modern vehicles today. A single GPU computer, surround cameras, maybe a forward-facing radar. It can drive in different places it's never been to before, uh, and it can drive different vehicle types. Um, so we are very um, excited to be in the process of commercializing this technology now, um, to seeing it deployed uh, across um, the world's most innovative fleets and vehicle manufacturers, and to see this deployed in a way that can um, realize value uh, 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 quickly and accelerate the growth from um, assisted autonomy through to full autonomy. Uh, and so we are, um, you know, uh, we are in that process right now. So far, uh, we've been excited to partner with some of the UK's largest fleets, fleets like uh, DPD, ASDA, and Ocado Group. Um, and these are large fleets that, that do things like grocery delivery here in the UK. Uh, and those partnerships have been wonderful. We've, uh, we've been delivering groceries uh, uh, throughout this year with our partners, ASDA, for example, in London, and showing some of the value that this autonomy, uh, that this autonomy technology can bring, so bring to society. Yeah, just on that, I imagine you still have a safety driver in the car. How is the regulation I don't want to get lost in that regulation discussion, but uh, is how, how are you managing uh, to operate? As you know, crews in uh, California has run into all kinds of uh, trouble. Um, but uh, how how is the regulatory environment allowing you to operate fleets, for example? Yeah, uh, it's a really important question. So today we operate with safety operators, um, but we have a you know two two pronged approach here. The first is that we want to see uh, the ability to to build value and see deployment of the system um, still you know as a driver assistance system or with with safety operators as you say, and um, and you know there's extraordinary value that can be brought there whether it's the um, helping support safety. Uh, or improving the efficiency of operating vehicles. You know, there's a big opportunity there uh, that we can see today through driver assistance. Um, but then on the other hand, of course, ultimately we want to get to level four autonomous driving at scale. Uh, and we've been really uh, excited about the work that we've done with regulators around the world, um, but most, uh, most specifically here in the UK. Uh, we've had a number of UK ministers for rides to show them the technology firsthand. We've sponsored the UK's parliamentary working group on autonomous driving technology, uh, and we've helped support uh, bringing legislation uh, to to um, uh, to be considered to to make uh, to make this technology legal. Uh, and we've uh, uh, been offered and are working on a, a 1.9 million pound grant with the, uh, the with the government uh, to help understand. Uh, and, and put forward a safety framework for AI systems. There's many more activities that we've been doing in this space, but we're deeply engaged with regulators and believe that uh, empowering regulators to understand AI technology and to, um, uh, yeah, empowering them to understand it uh, and to be thoughtful about how best to manage those risks is, is the mm -hmm. best way forward. So we've really uh, looked to do our part on that front um, and have been excited about the results so far, or the traction, I should say. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, I have questions about, about the compute intensity of this and the, the, the amount of training data, but setting that aside for a minute, uh, Mercedes Benz has, I think, uh, a level four autonomy in Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and the, regulations there allow uh, them to to uh, drive hands-free on certain roads and that sort of thing. Uh, how is that system working and how does that compare to uh, Gaia 1? Uh, and yeah, uh, answer that first. And then uh, so my understanding is that the I haven't seen a level four system from uh, Mercedes Benz or, or other uh, automotive manufacturers outside of the, the trials we've seen in China uh, or in 
in some parts of the US uh, with some of the technology companies. Um, I have seen a limited level three system, which is where the vehicle does take control and liability of the vehicle for certain scenarios. And I believe Mercedes have a product that allow you to do this at low speeds on a highway in, in um, you know, rush hour traffic. Uh, but, you know, uh, in general, the automotive industry is very, uh, we, we get to see, as an automotive industry, we get to see technology at scale, which can do, um, uh, productionized, which can do um, driving, you know, any vehicle anywhere, whether it's not just highway at low speeds, but urban, suburban, uh, different cities around the world. And that's very much what we're interested in solving at Wave. We want to build a drive, an AI driver, an artificial intelligence system that, that has the onboard intelligence to drive vehicles through all of the kind of scenarios that, you know, we expect in our daily lives and the commutes and the travel that we do. Um, we want to build this kind of technology to help assist people to free up their time, um, to make it safer on the roads, to give them a, a more sustainable drive. All of these kind of uh, benefits, we want to ensure this technology can be can be brought out um, quickly and broadly. Uh, we think that this is a unique opportunity in the space um, and uh, something that, you know, of course, the world, uh, uh, um, yeah, it's, 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 I, I think it's a, it's a really important next evolution that uh, we need to be able to, to, to deliver, to lift up the, quite frankly, the safety and, and performance of all of the cars that we're putting on the road today. Yeah. And for training uh, this system, I mean, one of the challenges, as I understand it, uh, of uh, other autonomous vehicle uh, control systems is they depend very heavily on supervised learning and you have to label enormous amounts of data so that the system recognizes uh, corner cases uh, and and there's this very long tail of of those cases um, is and for example uh, you can train a car to drive in California but uh, if you take it to uh, Norway or something with a vastly different climate it's going to run into trouble with uh, if it hasn't. Uh, if, you know, if the ha the if the snow hasn't been labeled uh, into the system and that sort of thing, uh, how much? How do you train uh, Gaia, and uh, can it generalize across environments in real time, or does it? Do you need to train it in advance for every uh, kind of environment? The interesting thing is that when you are driving, you're generalizing all the time. You will never see the same thing twice on the road. Every time you go driving, the weather is going to be slightly different uh, than you've ever seen before. You can have cars and other agents around you in different locations. So even if you're on the same road that you've driven, you're commuted every, every day of your life, uh, that uh, the, the specific things that you go through will be different in some way from what you've seen before. So I guess the first point to make is that autonomous driving is all about being able to generalize. We do it every time we operate these vehicles on the road. The question is how far can you generalize? It's one thing to generalize driving on the same road every day. It's another to drive on you know, one road and in the UK and then be able to drive in the US where you have new things like four way stop signs, right turn at red, other you know, local driving cultures. And so we want to build a system that can effortlessly generalize to new environments to allow us to bring it to everyone around the world. Uh, and how we've done that is, is our system is trained through unsupervised learning. So it doesn't need boxes drawn around objects or things labeled in the scene for us to learn how to understand the scene. It's all unsupervised. We watch driving data and learn from that how the world works, learn how to predict the future, train models like Gaia and these kind of things. So um, uh, it's all through unsupervised learning. And the key thing is, is that it becomes more efficient the more data you get. So we might need a certain amount of data to train in the UK for us to train a system and, and uh, for us to generalize a system to another environment like the US, uh, we will need a fraction of that data because a, a lot of the experience is, is shared, right? You know, the same rules of physics apply in both countries. People tend to 
behave in a similar way, although there are some differences. So you need a little bit more data. Uh, we found that um, going from a passenger vehicle to a van, for example, generalizing to a different vehicle, uh, going from a, a, a Jaguar I-Pace passenger vehicle to a, um, a, a 3.5 ton delivery van, uh, that took us about two to 3% of the training data to be able to achieve a similar level of performance on the van. And so generalization with end-to-end -end neural networks can be very efficient. It's like large language models learning to generalize from English to German to French to Mandarin to other, other you know, uh, mm -hmm. other languages. Um, and so those are some of the things that we think about when we look to scale our technology and generalize it to, to new driving scenarios. And and what about the uh, the compute uh, required uh, to to train the models and then to uh, operate the models? And do the models uh, operate uh, th through a connection to the cloud, or are they? Uh, is there a GPU running in the vehicle? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we don't train the models live on the car. They are safety assured, validated before they're deployed on the car. Um, rather, we take the experience we get driving all the time and we feed that back to the cloud in order to improve the new models that we'll be um, validating and deploying. Uh, so it's all trained at scale and we've been partnered for many years with our, our great friends, Microsoft. Uh, and We work with Azure to be able to train at scale. Um, you know, Azure has been able to provide us with extraordinary compute power, but more importantly, the innovation that you need to be able to deploy um, uh, to, to train these kind of models. The, 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 the tough thing with training video scale uh, foundation models like, like we do uh, is that the data requirements, I talked about the size of the input set into these models, it's truly ginormous. And to uh, train on this kind of data, you can't have it all sitting on the local compute nodes. It's tens mm -hmm. of petabytes maybe hundreds of petabytes, and so you need to be able to stream it to your GPUs. Um, this means you need a different set of infrastructure from when you're training a large language model. You can't have your data stored locally on the GPUs. You need to be able to stream it from um, you know, storage that you can do fairly random access across, and that's quite a hard um, infrastructure challenge. So we've been thrilled to be able to do a lot of pioneering work in the space with Microsoft to make it possible to train models at this scale. Uh, and and is that uh, uh, in order to get the uh, uh, the video into a do you do you vectorize it uh, in in order to tokenize it or how does uh, how does that that work? Um, yeah, we we take the video data or the experience or all kinds of data, and yep, it's it's tokenized, it's fed into the transformers at scale, uh, and and that's how it's trained. And it's it's not just video data; it's also the navigation prompt, it's the other robot sensors like GPS, um, you know, wheel speeds, things like this. All these kind of input data we uh, you know we 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 use and and feed into the AI. Yeah, um, I mean the reason I'm asking about uh, the compute requirements is uh, you know these large language models are amazing they're uh, people that are scaling them 10 times or more uh, from what we've seen so far uh, but there's uh, a limit in the availability of gpus for the time being and for the foreseeable not the foreseeable future but for for at least a few years uh and then, uh, be because of the, that constraint, the there's a limit on uh, the amount of inference any one uh, customer can uh, can use the model for. You know these rate limits. Uh, are, are, does a world model face those same constraints? Uh, sorry, Craig. I, I, can you? Can you clarify your question? Constraints around rate limits? Well, yeah, just on on the availability of uh, of GPUs, uh, both for training and for inference, uh, because you know it costs an enormous amount of money to train an LLM, but it uh, it also costs an enormous amount of money to to uh, uh, 
uh, on the inference side and people are accessing these models through APIs and because of the cost and the, and the compute constraints, they can only process so many requests a minute or so many tokens a minute. And that is really limiting the enterprise scale applications. So does that same kind of uh, problem run through a world model or is a world model less fundamentally less compute intensive and so you you can get around those problems well the great thing about our space is that at inference time most of the compute runs on the car and so right. assuming you've got vehicle assets to deploy on that are you know there and fleets and, and are you know are, are generating value then you know you're in a great spot because you can run all the inference you need on on the vehicles themselves um, so our challenge is really a training time. Um, yes, there's some inference costs, but it's it's more manageable because it's a hybrid edge cloud model. Um, uh, and primarily you need to have most of it on the car because the car should be able to have all the intelligence it needs to be safe and make it, it the kind of decisions it needs uh, to operate in an environment on board the vehicle. So at training time, it really matters. And there, yeah, I mean, we are uh, we are hungry for all of the compute and data storage that we can get to be able to um, power these models. And I feel fortunate to be writing Moore's law and other year on year improvement curves that just bring down the costs and increase the availability of increasing orders of magnitudes of these systems. But, um, uh, but no, we certainly do have appetite to lift what we've got uh, another 100 X to next year in terms of scale of, of data and compute and, and parameters in this model. Um, training computers as a really, a really important uh, factor for us. Okay, then uh, quickly uh, is uh, two questions. Is Gaia open source? And uh, I've been writing a lot about uh, why we don't see uh, humanoid robots uh, the way everyone uh, wants to see. And and one of the you know they're the hardware problems, but the other problem is is having a reliable uh, AI brain. Could this model be applied to uh, uh, other forms of embodied uh, uh, AI robots? That's an awesome question. And I'm really bullish on, on humanoid robotics being a part of the future. Uh, the technology we're building, we want to see this kind of embodied AI system empower all kinds of robots, whether it's manufacturing, domestic robots, or, or self-driving cars. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think self-driving cars will be the first big application of embodied AI at scale because there is data, there are hardware platforms, there is a business case. Um, and so it can be built today. Uh, I think getting the data and the hardware platforms for humanoid robotics is, is harder. But um, I hope that the scale of embodied AI we can build through self-driving can make that uh, easier by taking that technology and adapting it to humanoid robotics in the future. And I would love for Wave to, to, to be part of that once we've got uh, our self-driving embodied AI systems to scale. That's, uh, that's, that, that's really, um, you know, that's really the, the, the path we see. So I agree with you on that one, but I'm, I'm very bullish on in 10 years time AI, not just being chatbots and co-pilots, but, uh, but, but being all kinds of physical embodied uh, uh, AI systems in the worlds that we live in. Okay, and then the question on open source, is uh, Gaia open source? Uh, so guys, uh, we have written an extensive research paper around it, and we're very much fans of openly engaging with the AI community and um, and sharing ideas. Uh, we haven't open sourced the model itself for now, um, uh, and that's something that, uh, that we're continuing to iterate on and develop internally uh, and, and to use to, to deploy in our fleets with, with our partners. Hi, I wanted to jump in and give a shout out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist, and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 
25 because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. They support us, so let's support them. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Alex for his time. If you want to learn more about the conversation we had today, you can find a transcript on our website, ionai, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. And remember, the singularity may not be near, but A-I is changing your world, so pay attention. <laughs>